everyone. Good morning. Thank you, Steve, and the entire Media Post team for having us here. This is a pretty, pretty cool conference. I've never been to anything like this before. Uh, I'm very excited to be here in beautiful Pinehurst, though I'm not loving what it's doing to my hair. Um, hopefully everyone's nice and, and relaxed and ready for, for a good conference, given it's Monday morning. Everyone got some sleep last night. Hopefully not too many cocktails. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to give a quick intro on DraftKings. Um, luckily, we spent hundreds of millions of dollars in advertising in 2015, so probably everyone here has heard of DraftKings at least. But I wanted to give just a quick overview of what it is that we do. Uh, it's important for you to kind of understand a little bit about that. As I get into these slides, I've got some examples, and so it's important for you to kind of understand what we do. So DraftKings is a, sport, a sports entertainment company. We started out just having daily fantasy sports, and basically what that means is you are selecting a lineup of players from various sports teams, and those players score you points for real-life events that are happening in the game. And you're competing against other players' lineups for real cash prizes. We also, in New Jersey, just launched sports betting. In Sports betting is, is pretty simple. It's really just betting on the outcome of the game. So for example, you could bet on the Boston Bruins to win game seven of the NHL uh, Stanley Cup playoffs on Wednesday night, go Bees. Uh, we're also from Boston, in case you didn't know that. Um, cool, all right, so you guys have a little bit of a, of a baseline. That's what DraftKings is, that's what DraftKings does, so let's get started. How many people here have heard of the game Two Truths and a Lie? All right, more than I was expecting, which is good. Uh, for those of you that don't know, it's a fun icebreaker game that's become somewhat of a tradition at DraftKings. For all new employees, we have them come in and, and say three statements about themselves, two truths and one lie. Then everyone has to guess which one is the lie. It's a nice little get to know you kind of game. Uh, it's a pretty fun game. If you guys wanna find me at the happy hour later, we can play. It's, this DraftKings tradition is really the inspiration for what my presentation is about. This is called Three Marketing Lies I Once Believed. First up, lie number one. I'm an email marketer. Probably kind of an unpopular thing to say at the Email Insider Summit, uh, but hopefully many of you guys can relate to my story. So I started out at Vistaprint, as Steve mentioned, and we were working, um, we were very, siloed, kind of working in different channels. My focus was email, and I was really looking to just make an impact, anything that I could possibly do uh, to grow within the company. I wasn't really thinking about the overarching reason for why retention marketing existed, and really the impact it was having on our customers' behavior. As I've grown, I've realized that retention marketing isn't about one channel in particular, it's about our customers, and reaching those customers where they want to be reached. And that's not always email. Which brings me to my first truth. I'm a customer marketer. All right, now let's use me as an example. This is actually slightly embarrassing, but I'm gonna show you an actual screenshot of my phone. Half the room is cringing. I know this is kind of uh, not, not the right thing. A lot of people are uh, usually very uh, clean about keeping their phone, no more uh, of those icons, but for me, I'm not the person that you're going to reach in email. This signal here means that I, I'm not the person you're gonna reach on email, but you wanna know where I do convert every single time? When I'm scrolling through my newsfeed and there's a picture of a golden retriever on basically anything. <laughs> Shameless plug for the cutest dog that you'll ever see and the best mug I've ever purchased. Seriously though, how cute is that dog? <laughs> so now, you have a couple signals about me. You know, I'm probably not gonna respond to your emails, so don't send me those. Uh, but you also know that if given the right content, I'm pretty likely to convert in my newsfeed. That's what we strive for at DraftKings. Collecting information about our users and using that to really communicate with them in the places that they want to be reached. These are our top four effective channels. First up is email. It's actually still probably our most impactful channel. 
it's most effective for inactive users. So the users, um, most users are pretty comfortable giving you their email address. So we have a pretty good opt-in rate. And it's, be it's best for, because of its kind of long form format, it's best for driving awareness, education. You can kind of explain a lot in an email. Next up is app push. This shorter form, quick text format drives more of an immediate response. For us, we do things like sending this push a few hours before the contest goes live and telling people or reminding them to drive, um, to, come to, the con come to the site and draft their lineup. We've actually been known to take the, the site down a few NFL Sundays because of how immediate and direct this response is. The third is retargeting. We mainly use this channel for our opted out and unreachable users. And, and or for the people that are opted out or unreachable, or people like me who just do, are too busy and don't have time to read their 3,897 3, emails. And finally, in-app messaging, which my team fin fondly calls POP. I'll call it POP throughout the, com the, the rest of the presentation. So if I'm calling it that, I mean in-app messaging. This channel we use for an upsell technique. Once we already have our users engaged and on site with us, we'll use it to help deepen the relationship with them while we already have their attention. For example, after a user submits a lineup, we'll pop them with something to say, use this lineup in very similar contests, just like this one. It's very similar to the famous, based on your last purchase, this is what we recommend. So each of these channels can be used for what I've mentioned here, or they can be used in concert with one another. So this multi-channel test case, one proof point from this is we have a reminder that we send for DraftKings rewards. So we want to make sure that you are actually claiming those rewards with us. Uh, so we send out a reminder to make sure that you get, you get there and do that before they expire. We used to just send this out in email. And the team decided they wanted to send tests to send which, which communication or which channel would actually be best for this type of use case. So they tested sending just an email, just in push, and both. And the results were pretty exciting. Those users who received both the email and the push were claiming at a much higher rate, 42% higher than push alone and a staggering 78% higher than email alone, which you'll remember was our primary method before that. OK, so the key takeaway for lie number one is that we're much more than email marketers. Again, sorry, Email Insider Summit, but it's true. We're better defined as customer marketers. All right, on to lie number two. I don't have time for long-term work. Now, I know just about everyone in this crowd has dealt with this dilemma in the past. Maybe you're a small team with really high revenue targets or even just a team of one. It's very easy to constantly prioritize work that drives results today. This was especially true at DraftKings before this year. Now the truth. I have time for anything if I make it a priority. So let's look back at DraftKings from pre-2019. We were small and nimble with some of the hardest working marketers you'll ever meet. But we were constantly trying to keep up with the speed of sports. Right after one season launched, another one would be in playoffs. And then two weeks later, another one would launch. It was daunting. And we were quite literally running on a treadmill. It was much easier for us to continue to focus on our efforts on the next big sporting event and outrunning the competition than it was to launch a new welcome series or prioritize an action, the laundry list of behavioral triggers that we had. Have you guys ever heard of the three horizons of growth? Maybe not. It's a consulting term that's, that's a model built by one of those consulting firms that basically states there's three horizons of growth, or th three horizons of work that get you to a place of steady growth. The first horizon is very near-term work that's core to the mission of the company. By 2018, we had this down. We had a pretty good handle on the level of marketing, and we were getting pretty good at driving those results today. Horizon 2 represents emerging opportunities, work that takes a little bit longer to show an impact, but pays off much greater. 
We didn't really have much of a focus on this yet, though we really did want to. In Horizon 3, let's just say we weren't there yet. At the end of last year, with our inability to ever manage to get past the short-term work, we decided to give something else to try and peel off two people to focus exclusively on what we were calling trigger-based communications. This team would be creating communications that trigger after a behavior, or lack thereof, with the mantra of automation, aimed at creating a lasting impact in gold on increasing retention over time versus revenue today. With dedicated focus, this small team was able to get off of the sports season treadmill and begin launching over 35 new customer-based triggers in only six months. So what this means for our customer is that we went from sending 70% calendar-based communications and only 30% of these more behavioral-based triggers to 55, a much more balanced mix of 55% calendar-based and 45% of these more relevant personalized communications. Remember that winning email and push test from the last section? That test was done by our triggers team to help solve for a customer experience gap that players were missing rewards before they expired. That win was made possible by dedicating some resources to our longer lasting Horizon 2 initiatives. A couple of other proof points from our newly founded triggers team. The intention of the team is to find a quick win uh, using data and insights. So using these data and insights from our customers and uh, prioritize a roadmap of these one-off tests, continue to rap rapidly iterate. Once they find a win, roll it out and move on. First example is a quick win they found driven from an insight from our customer experience team. Our customers were getting frustrated because they had these free bets, think coupons, that were expiring before they got a chance to use them. We decided that we would test an in-app message, so pop, which we call it, um, right when a user opens the app. So as soon as they open the app, we pop them with this message, you have an un unused free bet, go use it. That pop no not only drove an 8% lift in redemptions on that day, but it also drove over 3% lift in two-week paid active rate. So it had both a short-term and a long-term impact for us. Long-term, two weeks, DraftKings is still a startup. The second example follows a similar pattern. The team wanted to find a win to reactivate a cohort of users that were recently inactive on our site. They started with a quick NHL test, the one on the left. You have an offer waiting. We sent them a push. You have an offer waiting. Uh, click here to claim. Once they clicked on the message, they would be popped with something in, in the app itself that gives them a free offer. So play today, and we'll give you something for free. And that had a pretty solid lift in active rate, up 11% for that cohort. So now we know that this concept is pretty strong, and it has some legs. So we tried in PGA as well. Very similar concept. You have an offer for all of the cohort of people who are two weeks inactive. And we saw an even better response, a 29% lift in active rate. So now, not only did we find a quick win that we could automate and roll out for NHL, we also found a win that we could extend to the 15 plus sports that we have on site. All right, so the key takeaway for line number two is to find an area that you're really interested in investing more time and dedicate resources to it for a while. With dedicated resources and a strong vision for what you're hoping to learn, I bet you'll be surprised with the results. All right, line number three, almost done. I'm a badass marketer, and I don't need any help. Now, this one is only partly a lie. It's supposed to cross out everything else. Sorry about that. I am a badass marketer, but I'm stronger with help. Now, if you're like most marketers at most companies, this one is a lie that you've had to tell yourself year after year when the engineering and product teams prioritize some flashy new feature instead of helping you build a stronger tool set or helping you automate that one campaign that your team sends out every single day. There are engineers in the room, I promise. The story is about to get nicer for you. The truth is, 
I'm way stronger with help. It wasn't until very recently that DraftKings finally, after years of me kicking and screaming, decided to dedicate a cross-functional team to helping us reach our goal of best-in-class marketing, building relevant and personalized messages at scale. This additional help consists of engineers, analysts, a product manager, and even a data scientist that are all helping to lay the foundation for what we need to build our robust marketing platform and help us reach our goals. Remember that triggers team we talked about in the last section? Their work to produce all of those awesome automated wins would not be possible without this foundational layer. With cross-functional experts and a single unified goal of increasing customer lifetime value, we're no longer competing for resources and we're beginning to make some pretty strong progress. We've started out with a strong foundational layer of tr triggered communications and are beginning to lay the foundation for our Horizon 3 growth. Yes, Horizon 3, we did it. <laughs> Horizon 3 contains ideas for profitable growth down the road, which for us, we believe, is personalized marketing, multi-channel marketing at scale. We're still very much at the beginning of the story here, so maybe this is a topic for next year's conference. All right, so what did we learn today? We learned that I will not respond to your emails unless you have my work address, uh, and that I really like golden retrievers, but that's not really something for you guys to action at home. So we also learned that we're not just one channel marketers, and we should really aim to listen to our customers and reach them where they want to be reached, and that the gains of multi-channel marketing speak for themselves. We learned that if we truly want to make progress on something, we need to dedicate resources to it for a little while and give it some room to grow. And finally, we learned that even though we are all badass marketers, we'll be stronger if we leverage cross-functional resources at a single goal. The moral of the story here is that even the things that we believe now to be our current truths will sometimes become our future lies. It's important to continue to question yourself and evolve and change your strategy over time. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Here we go. Uh, we have questions, Veronica, and throughout the next few days, those of you who have questions, if you could stand and let us know who you are and who you're with so we can get to know you. did a really good job, huh? You guys just know Well, I, I have questions, as I always do. I have, I have <laughs> questions. Um, uh, I, I'm curious, since in, in both of the, the key examples, the first two examples uh, had to do with, um, with hitting people across channels, uh, and, and of course, again, those two teams for calendaring and trigger, triggering. Um, tell me about overall frequency of messaging how this impacted frequency and whether on the back end you were seeing any response to either increased or different kinds of frequency with, with your users. Yeah, so with that cross-functional team and the foundational work that we've been creating with the um, engineers, uh, they've helped us to build this prioritization tool internally so that a user still only receives one contact per day. Uh, there's a couple of other internal notifications, so transactional type notifications that we allow to be a bit higher frequency, just because those are the ones that the customers need to see or want to see because they're more relevant. But anything that is either life cycle or calendar based is all prioritized against one another so that a, a, a customer only sees one communication a day max. Oh, over here. Yeah, I come to you. Uh, Doug Henderson, EAB. My question is um, around engineering allocation. So when you said that, my ears really perked up. I just recently told our um, head of engineering that um, his department is where good ideas go to die. <laughs> and uh, that didn't go over so well. Um, so uh, and any jobs available? For, uh, no. um, I want to know how you... Um, got the allocation and got the resources that you needed across those teams. How do you set the value proposition in such a way that you don't become de-scoped? That's another engineering term I've learned very recently. Um, how do you make that happen? How do you make um, the business um, and not um, drive strategy and not have the tail wag the dog? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I actually anticipated that question, so thank you very much for asking it. Um, show them the money. So what we ended up doing was we built a business case for what we actually thought that this automation would produce. We did a couple of super hacky tasks. Again, my team is awesome, uh, small, nimble, powerful marketers. So we did a couple of these hacky tests that, yes, they were not perfect, but they gave us real data that we could then say, we, it would be even better if we did this. So add up all of these different uh, tests, and this is what we're looking at in a business case here. How are the, t how are the both the, uh, the trigger and the calendaring teams talking to each other? What's the nature of the conversations between them? Uh, to decide how to, pri how to prioritize and given users or levels of users. And is lifetime value a part of this equation? Yeah, so the, the triggers based team in particular is actually looking to drive lifetime value. So through increased retention, keeping people coming back day after day, whereas the calendar based team is much more interested in driving revenue today, getting people back to the site today and making sure they convert on tonight's contests or whatever it is that's happening. Uh, but the teams are constantly talking. So they still sit together. They still have Slack channels uh, where they're kind of communicating every single day. They're prioritizing the communications between, um, between the groups every single day. And, and really, the, the difference between the two teams, the mantra is automation for triggers. So calendar-based stuff, they're coming up with cool promotions. They're uh, trying to get people to you know, play in multiple of the different NHL games in the Stanley Cup final. So, so they're trying to kind of uh, be more relevant to what's happening today, whereas the trigger-based team is trying to be more relevant to what's going on with that particular user. So if that user is suddenly inactive or if that user, their balance falls below a certain amount of money. Um, so they're talking to one another and, and generally Trigger's team probably gets most of the priority because it's, it's more based on what that user is doing. Uh, and it doesn't, it's not taking out all of the customers. It's just taking out the customers that are, that communication is most relevant for. And are you, but are you, are you actually uh, able to distinguish between higher and lower levels of lifetime value among, uh, or, or predict lifetime value among different users and then actually adjust the strategy according to that? Um, yes and no. We're still, we are still, a young-ish company. So on, at least on the draft, the DFS side, so daily fantasy sports, we definitely have a lot more data and we can, we can use some predictors. Um, there's some very, very easy ones. That's basically just the amount that you deposit your first time is, is likely to be an indicator of whether or not you're going to be a good quality customer for us. So we do have some of those type of, of indicators. On the sports book side, we just launched in New Jersey in August. So it's a, it's a bit more challenging because the data is fairly limited, but we're, we're working on getting there. And then finally, tell me about the creative side. Since you started by reminding us how much money uh, DraftKings is spending on mm -hmm. media across channels, I'm curious about brand consistency across those channels, how that's managed, and how important it is at this level of messaging uh, to maintain some of those themes creatively across all the different touch points. Yeah, it's actually quite challenging for us, as you can imagine. We have a ton of different channels and a ton of different teams that are all creating new campaign. So for us, it's important to be super nimble. My team is creating new HTML templates and new emails every single day. So it's not something where we can just say, hey, creative team, can you, um, can you create us nine emails for one day? That's not feasible. So my team also needs to be able to do stuff like that. Uh, so they've done a pretty good job of creating these kind of brand style guides and making us kind of sit uh, stay within those types of templates and guidelines. Uh, and we also actually hired someone who is exclusively focused on design for my team. And so she helps to kind of check things and make sure that um, the marketers aren't going a little too far outside of the box just to get a um, direct response. So, so we have some kind of checks and balances, uh, but mostly it's, they've done a pretty good job of putting together a style guide for us. Veronica, nicely done. Thank you so much for 